Oh, my God. Morning. Hope everyone had a lovely weekend. This morning has been so strange already because I went to school as did everyone else. Um, and I was there for like an hour, but the internet was out uh, and like, pretty much everybody had to like cancel their first period classes and stuff. Luckily I don't have first period. Um, but eventually they were like, uh, oh, we don't really know when it's coming back on. Cause we don't know. We don't know what's happening. So if you guys want to go work from home, you can. So I was there for like an hour and then came back home. Um, uh, All right, let's see who we've got. I know we're missing a couple of people. Ian, Corey, Christian um, is, yep, Brendan's here. Uh, no Hayward yet. Troy is here. Eli's here. Nate here. Chip. Chip's not here. Chip's always on time. Sterling and Andarius. Um, we'll give everybody like a minute and a half longer to come into our room. I had a, um, a question in the chat about whether I'm going to play people's podcasts. And the answer is, hopefully, um, the plan is maybe Wednesday. Um, I haven't listened to any of them yet. And I'd love to pull 
You know, I, I don't know what category everyone was doing. Um, so I don't even know if we have one from every category, but if we do, I'd love to play like the best one in my opinion from each, uh, from each topic, but we'll see, we'll see. And you know, if you did a good job, you shouldn't be embarrassed about it. That doesn't mean that you won't be embarrassed, but um, you know, it's, it's fun. <laughs> Uh, do, 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 do. Okay, cool. Who just showed up? It was Hayward, which means Chip is not here. And that's just so strange. He's always here. Maybe he'll show up. Okay, so um, today the plan is first of all to read the final letter in Frankenstein, which means that the frame part of the frame narrative will conclude and we'll actually get into Victor's story, the main plot of Frankenstein. We probably will not read anymore after today until Thursday, just because I've got other stuff planned. Um, but I want to go ahead and conclude that. And then after we finish with that, um, I want to talk to you about tomorrow and some grade stuff. Um, so let's, let's share my screen. Although you guys all have it. Um, also keep in mind, like, since we're reading Frankenstein now, um, I posted the PDF of the whole book on, I almost said Instagram, definitely didn't post it on Instagram um canvas and that's in last week's module so you might just want to remember that you can also find it in the files but it's not going to like move to the new module every week we'll be on it for a while um okay so we're going to start letter four here comes chip charles robeson let's uh let's get his attendance fixed right now so that we don't have to think about that later look there's all your middle names you can make fun of each other um, okay, so just to kind of recap where we we're at, Captain Walton's on this expedition. It's cold and terrible. Everything's really rough. He doesn't know if he'll make it back. He's writing these letters to his sister and the big complaint, anybody remember the big complaint, the one thing that he really wants? Wasn't it like a, another friend that's actually kind of intelligent or something like that? Yes, that's exactly it. He, he is looking for a friend. He wants to be able to just share everything that's going on. And like, there are all these other sailors aboard the ship, but he's like, well, they're kind of boring and not that smart. The one guy, he, he shared this one guy's story and he's like super nice. But he's like, he's kind of dull. He's nice, but he's dull. So he is hoping to find somebody who's his intellectual equal. This guy's got an ego for sure. Um, that doesn't mean he's a bad guy or anything. I don't think he is, but um, he's so obsessed with really like making a name for himself and doing something that nobody's ever done before and getting the glory for that. And he just thinks that nobody else is going to understand that. So it's been tough for him. Um, he just feels like he doesn't really have anybody to talk to which like it almost sounds kind of funny like this big adventurous mariner the one thing he wants is just a friend but also like of course of course he does you want to you want to have somebody to like share your successes with and you know talk about this incredibly important thing you're doing okay so we're going to start letter four would anybody like to read Okay, I will do it. This is the longest letter, keep in mind, but it's not gonna take the whole class or anything, or it shouldn't. So strange an accident has happened to us that I cannot forbear recording it. Although it's very probable that you will see me before these papers can come into your possession, which is a little bit shocking by the way, because he's sort of expecting not to come back or like not to see her for a very long time. Last Monday, July 31st, Harry Potter's birthday, <laughs> We were nearly surrounded by ice, which closed in the ship on all sides, scarcely leaving her the sea room in which she floated. 
Our situation was somewhat dangerous, especially as we were as we were compassed around by a very thick fog. We accordingly lay to, hoping that some change would take place in the atmosphere and the weather. About two o'clock, the mist cleared away and be, we beheld, stretched out in every direction, vast and irregular plains of ice, which seemed to have no end. Some of my comrades groaned and my own mind began to grow watchful with anxious thoughts when a strange sight suddenly attracted our attention and diverted our solicitude from our own situation. We perceived a low carriage fixed on a sledge and drawn by dogs pass on towards the north at the distance of half a mile. A being which had the shape of a man, but apparently of gigantic stature, sat in the sledge and guided the dogs. We watched the rapid progress of the traveler with our telescopes until he was lost among the distant inequalities of the ice. This, appeared ex this appearance excited our unqualified want wonder. Sorry. We were, as we believed, many hundred miles from any land, but this apparition seemed to denote that it was not in reality so distant as we had supposed. Shut in, however, by ice, it was impossible to follow his track, which we had observed with the greatest attention. So that is kind of a shocking thing to see. Like if you're out in, you know, the, the wilds of the North Pole or like you're on your way there and there's ice all around, but in the distance you see this like, huge creature this this huge man supposedly uh driving a dog sled it's unusual um and it's not um i don't know who that is um i feel like this is some foreshadowing i guess um that's pretty heavy-handed like if you know anything about frankenstein you can probably figure out what they're seeing but how and why about two hours after this occurrence, we heard the ground sea, and before night, the ice broke and freed our ship. We, however, lay to until the morning, fearing to encounter in the dark those large, loose masses which float about after breaking up of the ice. I profited of this time to rest for a few hours. In the morning, however, as soon as it was light, I went upon the deck and found all the sailors busy on one side of the vessel, apparently talking to someone in the sea. It was, in fact, a sledge like that we had seen before, which had drifted towards us in the night on a large fragment of ice. Only one dog remained alive, <laughs> Sad. but there was a human being within it whom the sailors were persuading to enter the vessel. He was not, as the other travelers seemed to be, a savage inhabitant of some undiscovered island, but an European. I don't know why it's an and not of, uh, but when I appeared on deck, the master said, here's our captain and he will not allow you to perish on the open sea. So we've got two travelers on dog sleds, apparently, because this guy's like normal-ish and the other creature that they saw was huge and like kind of savage looking and they're thinking he's from some undiscovered island. So, uh, but this guy's normal. On perceiving me, the stranger dressed me in English, although with a foreign accent. Before I come on board your vessel, said he, sorry, I'm not going to attempt the foreign accent. Will you have the kindness to inform me whither you are bound? Where are you going? You may conceive my astonishment on hearing such a question addressed to me from a man on the brink of destruction and to whom I should have supposed that my vessel would have been a resource which he would not have exchanged for the most precious wealth the earth can afford. I replied, however, that we were on a voyage of discovery towards the Northern Pole. And that is a weird question. Like if you came across somebody who was clearly like stranded out on the ice and probably not doing that well, all of his dogs except for one have died. So this is not like a habitable land. And you're like, come on board the ship, like trying to save his life. And he's like, I don't know, where are you going? Like, I've got things to do. And if you're not going my way, I'm not going to get on board. Um, it's a surprising response to this. Upon hearing this, he appeared satisfied and consented to come on board. Good God, Margaret, if you had seen the man who thus capitulated for his safety, your surprise would have been boundless. His limbs were nearly frozen and his body dreadfully emaciated by fatigue and suffering. I never saw a man in so wretched a condition. We attempted to carry him into the cabin. Ooh, wasn't emaciated a vocabulary word? I just thought of that. I never saw a man in so rich a condition. We attempted to carry him into the cabin, but as soon as he had quitted the fresh air, he fainted. We accordingly brought him back to the deck and restored him to animation by rubbing him with brandy and forcing him to swallow a small quantity. As soon as he showed signs of life, we wrapped him up in blankets and placed him near the chimney of the kitchen stove. By slow degrees, he recovered and ate a little soup, which restored him wonderfully. 
Two days passed in this manner before he was able to speak, and I often feared that his sufferings had deprived him of understanding. When he had in some measure recovered, I removed him to my own cabin and attended on him as much as my duty would permit. I never saw a more interesting creature. His eyes have generally an expression of wildness and even madness, but there are moments when, if anyone performs an act of kindness toward him or does him any of the most trifling service, his whole countenance is lighted up, as it were, with a beam of benevolence and sweetness that I never saw equaled. But he is generally melancholy and despairing. And sometimes he gnashes his teeth as if the impatient weight of woes that oppress him, as if impatient of the weight of woes that oppresses him. When my guest was a little recovered, I had great trouble to keep off the men who wished to ask him a thousand questions, but I would not allow him to be tormented by their idle curiosity in a state of body and mind whose restoration evidently depended upon entire repose. Once, however, the lieutenant asked, why had he come so far upon the ice in so strange a vehicle? His countenance instantly assumed an aspect of the deepest gloom, and he replied, to seek one who fled from me. And did the man whom you pursued travel in the same fashion, also in a dog sled? Yes. Then I fancy we have seen him. For the day before we picked you up, we saw some dogs drawing a sledge with a man in it across the ice. This aroused the stranger's attention, and he asked a multitude of questions concerning the route which the demon, as he called him, had pursued. That's just like an old-fashioned spelling of demon, but it, it's demon, it's not daemon. Soon after, when he was alone with me, he said, I have doubtless excited your curiosity as well as that of these good people, but you are too considerate to make inquiries. Certainly, it would indeed be very impertinent and inhuman in me to trouble you with any inquisitiveness of mine. And yet you restored me, you rescued, sorry. And yet you rescued me from a strange and perilous situation. You have benevolently restored me to life. Soon after this, he inquired if I thought the breaking up of the ice had destroyed the other sledge. I replied that I could not answer with any degree of certainty for the ice had not broken until near midnight and the traveler might have arrived at a place of safety before that time. But of this, I could not judge. From this, new time, from this time, a new spirit of life animated the decaying frame of the stranger. He manifested the great eagerness to be upon deck to watch for the sledge which had before disappeared, but I have persuaded him to remain in the cabin for he's far too weak to sustain the rawness of the atmosphere. I've promised that someone should watch for him and give him instant notice if any new object should appear in sight. Such is my journal of what relates to this strange occurrence up to the present day. The stranger has gradually improved in health, but is very silent and appears uneasy when anyone except myself enters his cabin. Yet his manners are so conciliating and gentle that the sailors are all interested in him, although they have had very little communication with him. For my own part, I begin to love him as a brother, and his constant and deep grief fills me with sympathy and compassion. He must have been a noble creature in his better days, being even now in wreck, so attractive and amiable. So maybe this guy's finally got a friend. He says he's starting to love him like a brother. Um he doesn't still know very much about him to be fair we haven't even mentioned his name although most of us can probably guess um but he's like he's he's really nice and I feel a lot of sympathy towards whatever he's going through and yeah he hasn't exactly said what's going on so it's very mysterious but he's obviously like really anxious to find this person this other person on the sled so um, we're going to continue taking care of him and like nursing him back to health. If we see this other guy on the sledge, then we'll let him know. I said in one of my letters, my dear Margaret, that I should find no friend on the wide ocean. Yet I have found a man who before his spirit had been broken by misery, I should have been happy to have possessed as the brother of my heart. Sweet. I shall continue my journal concerning the stranger at intervals. Should I have any fresh incidents to record? My affection for my guest increases every day. He excites at once my admiration and my pity to an astonishing degree. How can I see so noble a creature destro destroyed by misery without feeling the most poignant grief? He is so gentle yet so wise. His mind is so cultivated. And when he speaks, although his words are cold with the choicest art, yet they flow with rapidity and unparalleled eloquence. He is now much recovered from his illness and continually on deck, apparently watching for the sledge that preceded his own. Yet, although unhappy, he is not so utterly occupied by his own misery, but that he interests himself deeply in the projects of others. He has frequently conversed with me on mine, which I've con communicated to him without disguise. That's exactly what he was hoping for. 
He entered attentively into all my arguments in favor of my eventual success and into every minute detail of the measures I had taken to secure it. I was easily led by the sympathy which he evinced to use the language of my heart to give utterance to the burning ardor, another vocab word, of my soul, and to say with all the fervor that warmed me how gladly I would sacrifice my fortune, my existence, my every hope to the furtherance of my enterprise. Basically, I will do anything to make this mission succeed. And like, I'd give up my life. I would give up other people's lives. I would give up money if, I, if I'm able to pull this off. One man's life or death but were but a small price to pay for the acquirement of the knowledge which I sought. For the dominion I should acquire and transmit over the elemental foes of our race. As I spoke, a dark gloom spread over my listener's countenance. At first, I perceived that he tried to suppress his emotion. He placed his hands before his eyes, and my voice quivered and failed me as I beheld tears trickle fast from between his fingers. A groan burst from his heaving breast. I paused. At length, he spoke in broken accents. Unhappy man, do you share my madness? Have you drank also of the intoxicating draft? Hear me, let me reveal my tale and you will dash the cup from your lips. This is interesting and probably not like the reaction that he had anticipated when he told this guy about his expedition. Um, but he sort of freaks out about it a little bit. And, you know, he's talking about this madness. Do you share my madness? Which we've kind of established just through discussion that they have this parallel this this extreme desire to accomplish something incredible and are kind of willing to do whatever it takes to accomplish that in Walton's case it's journeying to the North Pole in Victor Frankenstein's case which is the stranger of course um it's reanimating something dead into being alive again um, so this is where he's kind of like, okay, I'm going to tell you my story. So maybe you can learn from what happened to me. Such words you may imagine strongly excited my curiosity, but the paroxysm of grief that had seized the stranger overcame his weakened powers and many hours of repose and tranquil conversation were necessary to restore his composure. Having conquered the violence of his feelings, he appeared to despise himself for being the slave of passion and quelling the dark tyranny of despair he led me again to converse concerning myself personally. He asked me the history of my earlier years. The tale was quickly told, but it awakened various trains of reflection. I spoke of my desire of finding a friend, of my thirst for a more intimate sympathy with a fellow mind that had, than had ever fallen to my lot, and expressed my conviction that a man could boast of little happiness who did not enjoy this blessing. Like, you don't have anything unless you have friends. I agree with you, replied the stranger. We are unfashioned creatures, but half made up if one wiser, better, dearer than ourselves, such a friend ought to be. Do not lend his aid to perfectionate our weak and faulty natures. I once had a friend, the most noble of human creatures, and I am entitled, therefore, to judge respecting friendship. I kind of forgot that. You have hope and the world before you and have no cause for despair, but I... I have lost everything and cannot begin life anew. This is really interesting to hear like before he tells his story. Um, and that's sort of when I was like, oh, I forgot. That's sort of, I forgot that he actually sets up a lot of his story. Like from the beginning, he says, I've lost everything. Um, now, does he actually lose literally everything? You know, there are so many people like in movies and books and stuff who are like, I don't have anything left to lose. And then they're proven that they do. Um, but he kind of sets it up from the beginning that he is down on his luck to say the least. He has lost everything. Um, he says he once had a friend indicating that he doesn't have him anymore. So what all has happened to this guy? Obviously we're going to find out, but um, he appears to have fallen very far. As he said this, his countenance became expressive of a calm, settled grief that touched me to the heart, but he was silent and presently retired to his cabin. Even broken in spirit as he is, no one can feel more deeply than he does the beauties of nature. The starry sky, the sea, and every sight afforded by these wonderful regions seem still to have the power of elevating his soul from earth. Such a man has a double existence. Ooh, that's a gothic idea, right? The two, the two things. 
Uh, such a man has a double existence. He may suffer misery and be overwhelmed by disappointments. Yet when he is retired into himself, he will be like a celestial spirit that has a halo around him within whose circle no grief or folly ventures. Will you smile at the enthusiasm I express concerning this divine wanderer? You would not if you saw him. You've been tutored and refined by books and ret ret retirement from the world, and you are therefore somewhat fastidious. But this only renders you more fit to appreciate the extraordinary merits of this wonderful man. Sometimes I've endeavored to discover what quality it is which he possesses that elevates him so immeasurably above any other person I ever knew. I believe it to be an intuitive discernment, a quick but never failing power of judgment, a penetration into the causes of things unequaled for clearness and precision. Add to this a facility of expression and a voice whose varied intonations are soul subduing music. It's a nice thing to say. Yesterday, the stranger said to me, you may easily perceive Captain Walton that I have suffered great and unparalleled misfortunes. I had determined at one time that the memory of these evils should die with me, but you've won me to alter my determination. You seek for knowledge and wisdom as I once did. And I ardently hope that the gratification of your wishes may not be a serpent to sting you as mine has been. Like, I hope that your ambition, your drive to achieve your purpose doesn't come back to bite you like mine did when I did it. I do not know that the relation of my disasters will be useful to you. Yet, when I reflect that you're pursuing the same course, exposing yourself to the same dangers which have rendered me what I am, I imagine that you may deduce an apt moral from my tale, one that may direct you if you succeed in your undertaking and console you in case of failure. Prepare to hear of occurrences which are usually deemed marvelous. We were among the tamer scenes of nature. I might, were we among the tamer scenes of nature, I might fear to encounter your unbelief, perhaps your ridicule. But many things will appear possible in these wild and mysterious regions, which would provoke the laughter of those unacquainted with the ever varied powers of nature. Nor can I doubt that my tale conveys in its series internal evidence of the truth of the events of which it is composed. So you're going to hear this story I recognize that it makes me sound crazy. He's like, you know, if we, in a normal setting, I would be afraid that you wouldn't believe me, but I think we know each other well enough. And, and once I explain to you in detail, there's no way, there's no way that I could make this up. You may easily imagine that I was much gratified by the offered communication, yet I could not endure that he should renew his grief by a recital of his misfortunes. I felt the greatest eagerness to hear the promised narrative, partly from curiosity and partly from a strong desire to ameliorate his fate, if it were in my power. I expressed these feelings in my answer. I thank you, he replied, for your sympathy, but it is useless. My fate is nearly fulfilled. I wait but for one event, and then I shall repose in peace. I understand your feeling, continued he, perceiving that I wish to interrupt him, but you're mistaken, my friend, if thus you will allow me to name you. Nothing can alter my destiny. Listen to my history and you will perceive how irrevocably it is determined. Interesting. He then told me that he would commence his narrative the next day when I should be at leisure. This promise drew from me the warmest things. I have resolved every night when I am not imperatively occupied by my duties to record as nearly as possible in his own words what he's related during the day. If I should be engaged, I will at least make notes. This manuscript will doubtless afford you the greatest pleasure, but to me who know him and who hear it from his own lips, with what interest and sympathy shall I read it in some future day? Even now, as I commence my task, his full toned voice swells in my ears. His lustrous eyes dwell on me with all their melancholy sweetness. I see his thin hand raised in animation while the lineaments of his face are irradiated by the soul within. Strange and harrowing must be his story, frightful the storm which embraced the gallant vessel on its course and wrecked it thus and that's where the letters end so basically he this guy's going to tell him his story uh and even though he hasn't said his name we know this is victor frankenstein um and he's gonna relate it all so basically like the whole book is supposed to be letters to his sister um and he like wrote this whole story down which is which is cool like it's a cool way of going about a frame narrative um so if you guys had to guess at this stage, we know that this is Victor Frankenstein. He says he's like, he's also sort of on a mission. He has one thing he has to do and he's been like looking for this other dog sled. Can anybody make any guesses about what his goal is at this point?
And totally fine if the answer is no. All right. Eh. Eh. <laughs> It's totally cool if you don't know. Um, this is also one of those situations where like I've read this book so many times that the like the foreshadowing is so clear to me, but like if you haven't read it before, you might might not be able to pick up on it. Um, you know how sometimes there's like a movie that you when it when the twist in the end is revealed, you go back and you're like, how did I not see this all along? This is kind of one of those situations. Okay, well, we'll figure it out. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna give you guys spoilers. Um, but when we start reading again, we'll pick up with Victor Frankenstein's story, which is very interesting. Okay, so we still have quite a bit of time left, uh, but I'm not going to hold you for very much longer. I'm going to talk to you about tomorrow. Um, tomorrow we'll meet and everything will be normal, except for we are rapidly approaching the end of the quarter, which is Thursday. I have to have all my grades in Thursday. Um, I have not graded your podcast yet, but today and tomorrow I'll be doing that. Um, so what I want to do tomorrow, I kind of told you guys last quarter, I'm not just going to continue to like give you makeup days and stuff. I did the first quarter because we just kind of started off rough and I get that. I, I genuinely have no idea when report cards come out, Eli. They, they don't tell us things anymore. Um, but what I'm going to do tomorrow is that everyone in this class, is this accurate? Almost everyone in this class has at least one zero. Um, and tomorrow I'm gonna give you the opportunity to make up one of your zeros and turn it in to me tomorrow. So what I'm gonna do right now, I want everybody to hang on to the call for a few minutes. Um, and I'm going to type in the chat privately to each of you what assignments are going to be the biggest things you could do to improve your grade. And primarily those are going to be like the writing assignments. Also, there's a couple of you who have not taken a quiz or have not submitted something that I know you did. So I want to kind of go back over that too and let you guys do those if you haven't um and I wouldn't count those late but I'm gonna you guys just like hang out for a minute while I'm messaging each of you and I'll let you know what you can turn in tomorrow to really help your grade I'm just going alphabetically. Also, if you, um, what was I about to say? If you have a lot of daily grades that are zeros, I'm not really including that in this um, because you'd have to make up like all of your daily grade zeros for it to affect your grade. Um, now, if you only have a daily grade zero, if you've turned in all the major things, then that's awesome. Um, so why am I writing everybody like a novel?
I hate that I made this person wait forever. <laughs> I only have one person who doesn't have an easy run. Okay, that's everybody. So um, make sure that you look at your messages. So you can see what I told you to work on. Um, obviously, it, a, a lot of people didn't turn in the satire essay. That's the, that's the thing that I'm missing the most of, I think. Um, since you know now, if you are one of the ones who didn't turn it in, you can um, you know, be working on that today and turn it in tomorrow. Um, I think that would be kind of hard to do in one class period. If you're missing one of the poems, those could potentially be easy to, to accomplish in one class period. Um, but you can see now what you're missing and you, you kind of know like how much you, how much time you need to allot for each thing. So tomorrow, um, I'll give you this class period to work on these things and submit them. If you get something done tonight, um, just make sure that you let me know you've turned it in. Um, hopefully that makes sense. Um, but hopefully this will improve y'all's grades. Not everybody's doing terrible. I feel like I kind of made it sound like everybody's doing terribly because everyone except for one person is missing something. Um, and Yes, uh, I'm just going to kind of wink at this due date. If you have not turned in your podcast yet, I didn't include that on the list because I made this list Friday before it was actually due. So if you have not turned in your podcast, you can still turn that in. Um, I would say, especially is the, would the podcast be able to bring our grades up at all? Or is it only in a situation where it's going to hurt us? The podcast can bring up your grade, yes. That being said, Bye. I haven't okay. put it in. I haven't put in zeros if I um, if you didn't turn it in yet. I just have not. Have well, not you did it. for the one thing that I didn't turn in. <laughs> so it is. It is in the grade book as a zero. Um, and right. I am, but not for the podcast. I I haven't put in right. zero. For yeah. The podcast. Yeah. So yeah. if you didn't turn in the podcast, then not turning it in will hurt your grade. Of course. Um, if you have uh if you have a really high average for your writing, writing assignments and projects, then um it might not affect your grade if you turn it in just because if you Well, I'll just be kind of upfront. I don't care that anybody knows that I have an 88. I would really like to have a 90 at least. Um <laughs> is that do you think that a really good grade on that podcast would be able to make that happen or no? You know what? Let me just let me open up my grade book and I'll test it out. And also, um, cause I would really like to not have to write that ballad. <laughs> <laughs> I will donate you some grade points, Chip. <laughs> Does it work like that? Are we redistributing the no. great economy? <laughs> How fun would that be? Awful. Uh, That'd be terrible. <laughs> Let's see. Brendan, I'm gonna send you this link actually to this um, to this thing and tell me if that tell me if that works. And for you, Chip. Am I looking at quarter two? I am. So yeah, the only zero I have is the ballad and that's already in the grade book so i'm actually just gonna like plug in let's plug in like a 90 and see how it goes okay see if it helps me i mean i'm sure okay you are and if we do that you need to make a 90. <laughs> At least a 90? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, like, let me, let me just see here. 
Let's hope yeah. I make a 90. Let's hope I make a 90. <laughs> <laughs> if I make a 90, it'll bring my grade up those last two points. Yeah. Okay. All righty. Um, also, another grade for you just to, oh okay never mind it, it fixed itself okay cool um also are, would you consider yourself mac savvy even like a little bit like ish yeah like ish okay can i stay after class so that you can help me because my computer's broken and i'm trying to fix things now yes <laughs> yeah. okay cool okay anybody else have any more questions about what you need to do tomorrow or anything we're still meeting tomorrow obviously um because i think some of you might have questions tomorrow and also just for attendance sake but you already know now that you'll just spend the class time working no questions here all right Cameron, hush. all right well <laughs> uh if you have no more questions you are free to leave and i will see you all tomorrow Or some people don't want to leave, and that's okay too. <laughs> um, but you can you can go ahead and tell yeah. me. Yeah. righty. So let me turn my camera on and show you what I'm working with. Because uh, first of all, I think it's kind of impressive, and okay. I need to show somebody. <laughs> okay. So hold on. Turn the camera around. So the MacBook with the broken screen is here, and it's closed. But I found a whatever that port is to VGA adapter uh -huh. and and now it's on this monitor and this yeah. monitor isn't broken. Okay. So I'm trying to figure out how to import my senior project onto this SD card and I can't figure it out. Hmm. Do you have any much experience with iMovie? <laughs> I do not have much experience with iMovie. Great. <laughs> because every time I try to, like it says that it imports it or whatever, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but then I don't see it anywhere. Huh. Or like I can share it to files. Yeah. Oh, but now it's doing just that one clip. Yeah, I did that before. That was a pain in the butt. Hmm. And th this is an iMovie file? Mm-hmm. Hmm. hmm. Okay, that's the whole project there. So I want to save it to downloads. <clears throat> and then it says it was successful. But then I go and I look in my downloads. And Is it possibly saving to anywhere except your downloads folder? Yes. Which doesn't make any sense to me. Hmm. And I really need to get, <laughs> to get the that project on yeah. <laughs> that SD card because that is that's very important. The whole school year has gone into making this happen and it's about to go down the toilet. <laughs> um, I really don't know what to do about that. I, even though I know Mike has a lot on his plate today, I would maybe email Mike and see if he has any advice. Yeah, gosh, it's Mike not really, a, it's not exactly a tech issue. Like your computer's working fine and everything, but <laughs> yeah. you're able to do what you need to do. Right. I might just do some like YouTube research, see what that leads me to. That is oftentimes a really good solution. Yeah, YouTube's great for that kind of thing. It is. Yeah. Um, do you happen to know which version of iMovie we have? Because I don't know how I would look that up. Hmm. Let me see if I can figure it out. If you don't, it's fine. I can, you know, figure it out. I, I was just more asking if that was something that you happen to know off, know off the cuff, like, you know. 10.2? 10.2. Are, are we on the most updated version? 
Um, you know, I'm not confident if you are. I I'm sure that I am because my computer's new. Right. Yeah. Okay. All righty. Well, I'm gonna keep working on that. Okay. Sorry, can't we have more help? <laughs> no. No. It's fine. It's fine. Don't worry about it. All right. Well. All righty. Well, yeah. And fingers crossed, I can get at least a ninety on. Fingers crossed. I feel like you'll. I feel like you'll be fine. Unless you're if it's gone like in something that you put no effort into, you should be okay. I I feel like I put a lot of effort into it, so it would be double bad if I got a really bad grade. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good to know. Yeah. All righty. Well, I will see you tomorrow. Okay. Bye. All right. Bye bye. And I'm going to go ahead and let the rest of you guys go too, because we only have like three minutes anyway until uh, the bell, which we won't hear since I'm in my home. But um, I'll see you guys tomorrow.